Hello everyone, welcome to, the mic is on, welcome to the pool car, mainly because we <laughs> we had to avoid the A11 and we haven't managed to find any services, so it's um, it's all in all been a, a weekend, a, a, a weeknight that's that's continued to give, I think. I'm here with uh, Paddy Davitt, we're live on Facebook, but this is also going to double up as uh, the Pink and Norwich City podcast too, so plenty for you to enjoy over the next 15 to 20 minutes oh, I'm sure if we can hack it out for that long uh, I had my say on on the Facebook feeds and what have you over over, over uh, bef- last night so you can catch that all on the YouTube and Facebook pages and what have you pad it's your turn now last night what did you make of that uh, wonderful 1-1 draw with Bristol City um well it's more more of the same really isn't it it's, you know it's not beat about the bush they didn't let him five so, so that's a that's a positive <laughs> improvement improvement yeah that's a positive yannick wiltshire scored a goal showed possibly what he could offer down the line but other than that and and this wasn't sheffield wednesday let's get let's make no bones about it it wasn't a team potentially in the mix for top six this is a team fighting for their lives who hadn't won more than one league game since december the 4th and in the first half, particularly, they looked. I thought they were as poor as maybe Blackburn on the opening day. You know, so if you could have cherry picked an opponent for Norwich to try and repair some fragile confidence, that was the one. And and having got their noses in front, having wasted two or three excellent opportunities prior to that, um, and then seen it too often away from home. You know, just this creep, creep, creep of set pieces, calamitous sort of decision making, inviting pressure on themselves, and then piece the resistance another set piece concession as Alex Neal himself said the guys put it in waist height about three yards out from a corner um, and then I mean then dear oh lord for I mean that was the 78th minute for the for the next five or ten minutes it was like the Alamo it was like they were playing Barcelona not Bristol City um, and if it wasn't from McGovern then they would have lost that game and then the recriminations would have been even more toxic at, as there has been since the final whistle and obviously you take the temperature on social media Again, it feels like another no, a new low, given who they were playing. But for me, it's just more of the same. Didn't expect anything different to what I saw. Those players, we've said it countless times now, away from home, not fit for purpose, not for those type of tests. Can't win away. Uh, the top teams can't win down the bottom teams. So, it, again, we're in this holding pattern now. Unfortunately, they still have 10 fixtures to fulfil. Forget the playoffs. It's about re- rebuilding. And then... The next point is, is Alex Neil the man to do the rebuild? A lot of fans, clearly, if they were undecided after last night, that seems to have been the final straw. We'll see what Blackburn brings, but it's not going to be pretty, I don't think. (laughs) No, it's not going to be pretty. Uh, Thanks for your message, Keith. He says that Norwich should have thrashed uh, Bristol City last night. I mean, I I actually predicted that Norwich would lose. Uh, uh, It did, because I just felt, you know, would they be capable of giving a reaction to Saturday with effectively nothing to play for so soon after? I hadn't quite twigged how bad Bristol City would be because in terms of it they've got a wonderful stadium what they've done to Ashton Gate is fantastic the facilities are incredible but it's almost too big for them and likewise just the quality on the pitch from Bristol City was as you said as poor as we've really seen all season 944 Norwich City fans made that trip yeah. I mean, what, what can you say about that medals all round I hope they were giving out medals for that well to be honest a little bit like war heroes they'd, they'd have a they'd have a chest full of them now all the ones who've gone to a lot of those away games um, as we flippantly joked in the car on the way I didn't see Cardiff I wasn't here for that game so the last time I saw Norwich win away from home was Wolves I think I think we'd worked <laughs> yeah. out and that was literally a couple of days after the implosion at Newcastle which to me looks like a watershed now in the season up to that point okay they weren't free flowing but they were firmly in the mix for the top two had briefly been top since what happened in the last sort of three minutes at St James's Park, September, I think that was, it's just been down, down, down with the odd brief spurt, spurt sorry, of positive results. But, I mean, it's just, what can you say to those? And again, they made their feelings quite clear. By the end, I thought they stuck with the team for the majority. Um, but once they conceded a goal, once they saw what was happening, once they saw Seb Basong replacing Josh Murphy, um, you know, they made their feelings abundantly clear and... Uh, they don't think Neil's the man for the job and you can't really blame them for, yeah. because they've paid their hard earned that's the divergence and we've seen it you look at the for, you look at the home form and the away form people who maybe only see Norwich at Carrow Road they would have one perception of Norwich 
But those 944, you'd imagine a majority of them have been to a lot of the away games and they will have seen the other side, which is all the worst traits of this group of Norwich players and management. And you can't blame them if, if they're at the end of their tether. I don't blame them at all. Yeah, Sue p- posted a message saying what was the Basong substitution all about. I mean, ultimately, the logic well, was it. quite sound, wasn't yeah, it? No, I, I, asked it, I asked him direct after the game because obviously, you know, the reaction was pretty furious, I thought, from the away end. And his reasoning was at that point, they've gone 1 1. Um, and then Bristol, as I, as I said earlier, it was literally Alamo job. And he just felt they were basically pinned in. They needed another guy who could throw into the back line, who could head a ball, put his body on the line. And he just had to sac- quote had to sacrifice somebody to make that change, and he thought Josh Murphy was the guy. He kept Wiltshire on, didn't he? he kept Naismith and Jerome and Johnny House somewhere on there. And it, as he said, they had two or three counter attacking opportunities, and they picked the wrong pass or the decision making was poor. Um, but he justified that that I guess ultimately they were in danger of not not even getting a point. And so, uh, but that to me tells you how far Norwich have fell. It wasn't, as I said, the logic solid in terms yeah. of what you think of it. It's just probably the immense frustration that they even needed to do that. Yeah. And and the negativity, I guess, of going to a side like Bristol City, as Norwich fans will see it, yeah. and having to hang on yeah. when their record is so atrocious. But it's nothing we don't know and it's nothing the fans don't know. And I guess even Alec himself is like, well, yeah, what am I supposed to do in a way? <laughs> well, I mean, it, I mean, it, I mean, in that game, you had literally, they've got themselves in front. The confidence is so fragile, but you think if they can hang on there, then that, that might give them a platform to pick up a few positive results between here and the end of the season. But as soon as Bristol scored, and they were threatening. I mean, McGovern's had to make two or three saves. Russell Martin, again, uh, unbelievably lacking in confidence. His decision-making's all over the shop. Um, thought he was very lucky to, to keep his place last night. Closer, whether he had a little back problem or not, he wasn't in the mix. And I was very surprised to see Russell Martin was, but that's a different issue. But you know, it just showed once once they went back on level terms, it was like watching a team of well, basically rabbits in the headlights. You know, they looked so bereft of confidence, um, shell shocked. You know, it's not too strong a phrase in my opinion. And as I say, between now and the end of the season is is one aspect of this story how it plays out from now. But it, we're clearly thinking this season's gone. If they've got any pretensions to get anywhere near challenging at the top end next season, that summer, massive clear out. And we've said it, you know, I'm getting sick of saying it now, <laughs> since, particularly since Sheffield, five o'clock Saturday. Um, and there'll be there'll be barriers, there'll be obstacles financially to try and do that and try and move players on. Some will want to go, some won't want to go. Some will have options, some won't. But I'm sorry, but Alex Neal, whoever's running the CEO side of it off the pitch, massive summer ahead and it needs to start now you know it's no point now basically um, sort of sleepwalking to the end of the season and then addressing the issues in the the summer it needs to be happening now and then you might at least put in the the preconditions to try and turn this slide around because it's a club on the way down at the minute ultimately I mean do you do you think personally that the club therefore needs to come out and say anything at this moment in time? I mean, yeah, we've had people, you know, ask us, you yeah. know, and the people are trying to make that happen, and the, you know, it's time for the club to make a statement where they're still, I guess, carrying out their internal restructuring and how they want to progress themselves yeah. in a way. It's it's a bit of a, it does feel like there's a vacuum at the moment. Yeah, no, quite right, and and that's amplified by what's not happening on the pitch. You know, if they were, if they'd continued in that vein, kind of early part of this. Well, basically pre-Burton, you know, if they'd have continued ticking off wins unbeaten, then it's less of an issue um, what needs to happen around the club. But clearly now um, the focus is firmly on a sense that we're drifting again. You know, on the pitch it's not working. A lot of fans think it's not working in the dugout and clearly then also that part of that flows into what's happening off the pitch. You know, Jez Mox is gone, Steve Stone we know is in an interim capacity, but... That needs to be resolved definitively, one way or the other. In terms of statements, then, it, well, it's what what people want. You know, do people want to come out and say Alex Neal is the man, and he's gonna we're gonna stick with him again? Because I'd imagine if that is the the message from, there'll be a lot of fans who won't be happy with that because they don't want him in in place. So, you know, it's kind of what message that do people who are calling for messages want? If if they were to be told Alex Neal is the man and he's going to be given free reign to change it around and and really really change around we're not talking tinkering around the edges massive surgery on that squad and they'll support him as much as they can financially to do that then okay we've got some clarity and we kick on from here um whether you agree Alex Neal is the right man or not we know where we're going but 
as I say, if the majority think Alex Neil isn't a the man, then a statement, because we had that effectively pre-Christmas when they'd lost 8 in 10 um, through Moxie, through Delia and Michael's interview with the with the Times, that Alex Neil was the man. And, and that, to me, didn't, didn't assuage those who thought it was time for him to go. The only reason it's calmed down is because, as I say, Brentford New Year's Eve onwards, um, they actually put a few results together and that calms everything down. Um, so I don't know. It's, it's it's what people want to hear from the board. Do they want do they want to hear, we understand your frustrations, but this is the man we're going to go with? Then fine, but I'm not sure it's really about words now. It's about actions for me. Um, uh, Robin Briggs says, we look like we're in a bit of a fog, much yeah. like Alec Neal on a match day. Well, I think that's just the camera. Like, oh, we're in a we're fog. We're in a fog, yeah. Oh, right, but, you know, yeah. That's, I thought that might, you know, lighten the mood. We're in Royston, I think. <laughs> we're in that's Royston. where we are, to be accurate. Some would say that's the same thing. Uh, this is going to be the point in the podcast where you are about to hear from Alec Neil and Yannick Vilschut. I've been working on my pronunciation. There. Did you like that? Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah. Cheers, mate. Uh, so the, the one thing I'm, <laughs> I'm a bit worried about, I don't know if worried is the right word, but, I mean, Bristol City were, were effectively a very poor side, yeah. even though they rallied. Norwich have got Blackburn and then... Barnsley at home for the next two Saturdays, a weekend off, and then they get into April where they've got five de- five games in seventeen days, most of them against high flying sides. What what is this Norwich side going to do against teams that are going to have things to play for this season? It could, uh, I'm worried about what they're going to turn out for the rest of the season. I've got to be honest. Well, I mean, ultimately, as I say, you look at it now, and if he, I mean, he made four changes last night, but it still wasn't. Um... On you go, Ben Godfrey. On you go, James Madison. On you go, Alex Pritchard. Which I think, certainly, I felt he might go down that route now. But but he was pre-game still, uh, and you understand it, Johnny Housen as well to a degree in that kind of rock and hard place where okay, it looks pretty forlorn to get anywhere near the playoffs. But you still had to go into it, I suppose, with the view that you could probably, if results fell for you. I mean, he was talking about you don't know where you'll be in seven games time. I think we all knew where they were going to be, but. OK, so that's one more ticked off. They're still nine points away. At what point is the watershed moment where, OK, I'm saying I'm going to make massive changes to this squad. I'm said I'm saying I'm going to move on some of the older players. Well, let's let's actually see it. Let, let's see a starting eleven with Madison, with Godfrey, with the Murphys, with Pritchard. And, and, and if that is the case and they go into those games you're talking about, then they'll probably get beat in the majority of those because they're not ready. You know, they will make mistakes. They are inconsistent. We see it with Josh. We see it with Jacob this season. As much as Jacob's had a breakthrough season, he's still inconsistent and he's not probably at the levels he was early part of the season. If you put more of those lads in, you will get more of those type of performances. So, OK, a bit of realism. They might not win too many more games between now and the end of the season, but at least it's a visible sign that, I'm sorry, lads, Alex, Tete, Russell, Martin, John Ruddy looks like, I think it, we might be getting to the end of his Norwich career. You know, there's a, there's a core group there, fantastic servants to this football club, a lot of highs, one or two lows as well, it has to be said, but time waits for no man. And and if the fans were to see that, tangibly see that between now and the end of the season, I'm, I, would, I would guess that the majority of them would sort of row in behind it. But, you know, if it's still going to be Stephen Naismith, if it's still going to be Alex Tete, it's still going to be Russell Martin, um, then no. I think you're going to get more adverse reactions like you had on Tuesday night. And the problem is now, of course, we've been away from home and as much as we're talking about how many have travelled in, in, in large numbers, if if Blackburn come to Car Road on Saturday and basically do a number on Norwich, then I'm sure 25,000 will really take them to task. So, yeah, personally, what will what will we see in these games? It depends on what team he goes with, ultimately, doesn't it? Indeed. Uh, the question there from Darren about does the board actually want promotion? Discuss. I feel like we're going to we're going to bank that one, and we're going to come back to that. Uh, and we're, we're literally we're going to have like weeks to discuss all this stuff. So we'll definitely come back to that one. Um, but what I did want to touch on just the players who who didn't feature in the end, who got dropped or rested or whatever. Whatever. I think it's fair to say that Wes Houlihan and Jacob Murphy were probably rested just yeah. to give them a break because they've looked a bit tired, maybe a bit out of form. Maybe the bigger crux of issues were with John Ruddy, who was dropped to the bench for Michael McGovern, and of course is out of contract in the summer, but the club has an option to extend that if they wish. And Tim Closer, who wasn't in the 18 at all, but had a slightly dicky back in a way that Alec Neal kind of said, yeah, his back was sore. <laughs> um, those two, I mean, could be could be awkward end of the season for those two, really, couldn't it? 
Well, in, in the sense that well, we don't see him again. We might not see him again, no. possibly. Well, possibly, yeah. But again, to, to, at the risk of repeating myself, it, if that is to be the case, then to me that's a clear signal that, OK, end of an era. Thanks for all your service, lads. Ruddy, obviously, a lot more than, than Tim Closer, who's only been in been the building, a, well, two seasons as it will be. But, you know, we're going in a different direction now. You're not part of it. Um, thank you and goodbye. Um, and that is the reality. And, and it wouldn't be just those two. I'd like to see a few more thrown into that. And... Uh, and then, then there might be some grounds, cautious leave for optimism, but still it would hinge on who they could then bring in in the summer because that squad is going to need reinforcing and uh, and players who can actually handle the rigours of the Championship because, and Alex Dill effectively admitted that to us on Monday prior to the Bristol game, that squad hasn't been fit for purpose and ultimately he, he carries the can because he's the one who uh, went into this season with a group of players who he felt were capable, singularly haven't been. So, really, there's a lot of pressure on him. I mean, ultimately, you, a lot of people are saying to me that see the parallels with Worthington with the season when they came out of the, the Premier League and, and obviously Delia backed him and, and it didn't it didn't work, did it? And then he was gone by the following September of the, of the new season. I just think, clearly, Alex Neil, any credit he had has is, is long since been uh, taken away. So, you know, this summer, massive, and then the start of next season, massive, for that man more than anything else. I also think with Nigel Worthington, I mean, the guy had been here six years and he had built sides up over that period of time. He had built the side up over two or three years to get them up in the first place. Yeah. I know he you know, got got it right with a couple of really key signings, but he'd had that time and proven himself. Really, if you want to distill what Alec Neal has proven as a Norwich City manager, it's that he came in halfway through a season and galvanised a group. Really, since then... I'm not sure we've seen any significant yeah. success because, I, you know, it, it was indifferent in the first half of the Premier League season. The second half of the Premier League season was a joke, really. I mean, still, that 3-0 defeat at Bournemouth still sticks in my head as, as much as anything. You know, it, it's... And I guess that's probably one crucial discussion that everyone, every Norwich fan has got at the moment. Alec Neil, yeah, however the club wants to go forward, is he really the man to rebuild the squad so that they can take it forward over the next two or three years? And I think some people have some real reservations, reservations over that going forward. Uh, and some, you know, fans aren't happy, and they want they want some fans want action, don't they? Some fans yeah. want to protest. Some fans well, are happy enough yeah. with you know get letting Alec rebuild things. Well, this is it. Yeah, this is the thing. I mean, if there was if there was one common goal and whether it's fan groups, whether it's just individual fans as a collective, if they expressed it in we want X to happen, then fine. But I don't get that sense. I, I, as you quite rightly, I think, have sort of phrased it there, that there are some who are willing to give him a chance if he then takes the handbrake off and really revolutionises that squad of players. And there's others who think, no, as you rightly say, yeah. I mean, really, it's second half of last season onwards. There's nothing in the way he's gone about his management, in the way... Him and the recruitment side have gone about their recruitment with the odd bar, by the odd success, maybe, to inspire any confidence that this summer there will be a massive turning of the the super tanker and 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 putting it back into a positive direction. Um, but again, I get a bit like when he went into the start of the season with a group of players he thought were good enough. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. We just don't know, do we? Whether he can oversee that major surgery or not. But um, but ultimately. It doesn't really matter what we think. It doesn't really matter what the fans think because ultimately the people in charge of the, this club, if they feel he's the right man, then it'll be him taking it forward. And, uh, you know, we can all make representations outside the club, but ultimately it's, you know, Delia, Michael and, and her fellow directors. If, if they are still steadfast in the belief that Alex Neal is the man, then he will at least get a chance to, uh, t to show that he can turn it round. But it's a very, very dairy depressing situation at the minute I think it's safe to say and uh, as I say this season can't end quick enough for me speaking of which I think we should go home but um, thanks for everyone for watching and listening uh, well obviously on the Pinkham Facebook page and the podcast will be out on Audio Boom too so I uh, really appreciate your comments as well uh, Facebook Live needs to Im improve its feed because they, they click through so quickly it's really hard to, to um, bring them all but we really appreciate those we'll try and do more of these videos shall we Fad? In a car. In a car. Well, I don't think. Well, we're fogging up again. <laughs> no, 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 no. If we can find a better backdrop, but yeah, 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 why, yeah. Not? why not, mate? We'll, we'll try.
I mean, literally, it's better than what we were looking at last night. So I think that's fine. Anyway, uh, yeah, so thank you all. Uh, we'll uh, see you again after Blackburn. We'll have all the preview and, and build up and what have you there at Pinkin.com. And the Pinkin show is live tonight from 7 p.m. on YouTube and on Mustard. So uh, keep an eye out for that as well and, and join in. You can um, text us in during the show and um, slag everything off or big it up however you wish. Right, uh, sign off. Thanks all. Goodbye. <laughs>